Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about the ancient civilizations of a land called Turkey. My guest today and our tour guide on this fantastic journey is Engen Cadister. Ms. Cadister is the Vice President and Manager of Turkey at its Best, a virtuoso preferred tour operator in Newport Beach. Welcome, Engen, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thank you so much, Dave. It's such a pleasure to be here, talk about my favorite subject. And since we're on that subject, I want you to pull back a little bit and give us the overall perspective, because we're going to, we're going to be talking about a number of civilizations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in Turkey. Mm -hmm. As you look at it, again, taking a step back, what is it that impresses you the most or takes your breath away the most about Turkey's ancient civilizations? Ah, what a lovely question. The thing that is so unique about Turkey is the fact that it is like an open air museum. The whole country is like an open air museum. Wherever you excavate, you come out with something ancient. Some new civilization just was found about two, a uh, new kingdom was just uh, found about two, two, two weeks ago. So the fact that a new civilization all of a sudden appears in front of our very eyes makes me love that civilization at that time, but I love them all. All right, well, let's talk about why so many ancient civilizations took root in Turkey and, or ended up there, and why was that the case? And do we need to establish the map here? Yes, I think it will be okay, a good, a good idea map. to look at the map because the map will show you where Turkey, in red here, is shown. As you can see, it's between Europe and Asia, and south of it is Africa. So it's right in the middle of these three big continents. So it is physically a bridge. Most people who moved from Asia to Europe went through Turkey. The climate is much better. Everybody went through Turkey. Some of them settled down and started these amazing civilizations. So it is really a bridge, and that is why we have so much of history in that one uh, country. And the term crossroads of civilization is the term. Is you hear exactly, often. exactly describes this fact. Um, also, Turkey is known by a couple of other names. One mm -hmm. is Anatolia mm -hmm. and the other is Asia Minor. Yes. So, how did those labels or those identifiers come right. into being? Asia uh, was a word that the Hittites used, probably started by the Hattis that they took over or merged with. And it meant the uh, area east of Anatolia or Turkey as we know it, Asawa they called it, eventually it became Asia. Anatolia is a Greek name which means to the east where the sun rises because they thought of everything east of, uh, east of uh, Greece was Anatolia where the sun rose. And Asia Minor was coined in the fourth century by a Christian uh, historian who thought that there was so much stuff in uh, in Asia Minor, that it was almost like a continent. And it deserves to be a semi-continent Asia Minor because of all this wonderful, prolific history that the country has. Well, let's go ahead and get started talking about that history. We're going to start with uh, a visual of an area called Gobek Latepe. Mm -hmm. And so let's put that on the screen. You can see it there, uh, a temple, a yes. circular temple that was uh, as we found out, uh, developed and engineered about 12,000 years ago. 12,000 years ago. Now, the, it is the greatest archaeological find of the 20, 20th century. It was found in the late 1990s mm -hmm. uh, by a uh, shepherd who found a little piece sticking out of the ground, took it to the museum, and all of a sudden they realized that this was something that was out of this world. The reason why it is so unique is because not only of its age, it predates the Stonehenge and the pyramids by thousands of years, but it also makes, has to, it also changes the history. We have to rewrite the history books. When I was in a college studying to be an archeologist, I realized that we were learning first, the human beings were hunters and gatherers, then they discovered agriculture, they tamed animals, they built cities, then with the cities came religion, the temples. This wipes it all out. The people who built those were really hunters gatherers. So they would spend just a couple of days in a week hunting and be picking berries or vegetables, whatever they had. The rest of the time, they built these colossal uh, circular temples. We don't know too much about them. We don't know who they were, 
but they worshipped in those places for about 2,000 years. Imagine how long a time 2,000 years is. A long time. And after 2,000 years, it was so sacred for them that they brought tons of earth to cover it up. So today, when we excavate, most of the pieces are there. Uh, huge, heavy, colossal columns, T-shaped, with amazing carvings, all done by stone, uh, stone, web, stone tools, tools right. where people did not even have houses. There is no housing. How did they get together and build these things? So religion came first. History books have to be rewritten as a result of the finding of this place, Quebec de Tepe. Let's take a look at another slide which shows us what that area looked like uh, at, in its heyday of about 12,000 years ago. So mm -hmm. there we see an artist's illustration. So this is an illustration. Right. They had these circular, and it's interesting, in quite a few different parts of the world, they do have circular temples. So circle is a very important uh, symbol, I guess. But you see the two very tall uh, T-shaped columns in the, in the middle, those are the ones, and also the little ones as well, have such amazing carvings, primarily of wild animals mm -hmm. and male figures. No female figures here, which is very interesting. Male figures with their belts and everything, you can see them. You can see how they buried, uh, uh, they did not really bury their uh, dead people, they had different methods, but we learn a lot from those carvings in mm -hmm. this in this amazing uh, temple. Yeah, we should probably move on to the next uh, area in the interest of time. Mm -hmm. We're going to venture on now to an area, and I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, okay. so you'll have I'll to forgive you. me. I'll tell you. Okay, it's Chetal Huyuk. Chetal Huyuk. See, we knew before Gebekli Tepe, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, we knew that Chetal Huyuk was the oldest Neolithic civilization in Turkey. It's one of the largest, best preserved, Neolithic civilization going back to 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. But with Gebekli Tepe, of course, now we know this is brand new, in relatively speaking, although it's about 10,000 years old. The city is very close to Konya, ancient city of Iconium, biblical city of Iconium, in the middle of the country. And it, the excavations are still going on. They've discovered a city that has art for the first time. They are they, we have the first landscape painting on the walls. The eruption of a volcano is portrayed. The houses were entered from the ceiling. They had ladders. The houses were all together like one piece, except the ladders going down. They also had these weird uh, uh, traditions, like they had the oxen heads mm -hmm. and other wild animals, which they plastered and used in their rooms. For what reason, we don't know we are assuming that they were remembering their hunting days because by that time they did discover agriculture mm -hmm. and they did tame some of the animals. But those wild animals were still in their psyche because that's how they lived from in the hunting days. And I understand as they excavated, they found 18 different layers or 18 different uh, no, rows? Not, uh, no, but they are, they are finding a lot of new stuff there. They, they how, the city really spread for that time period of history, it was like New York. I mean, it was a big mm -hmm. city at that time. And they're finding some other places not nearby mm -hmm. that um, uh, are connected to the city. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's move on to our next site, which is the city of Hattusa. Hattusa. And uh, we have a slide, as we see there, and it's uh -huh. called the Lion Gate of yes. Hattusa. Uh, this was during the Hittite Empire, right? And this was the capital city. Right. And in its heyday, it had something like forty to fifty thousand people living there. Uh -huh. This was in the 14th century BC, which would be about 33 to 3400 years ago. Uh, how large and how influential was the Hittite Empire? And what else do we know about uh, this particular city? It is a very impressive empire. We always knew, in the, starting from the 1900s, when there were archaeologists who were excavating in Mesopotamia and Egypt, we knew there was the Egyptian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, and the Babylonian Empire, but there was one missing empire in Asia Minor, and we did not know what it was. It turned out to be the Hittite Empire. When the first uh, Lions Gateway was seen by Charles Hexier, he realized that this was something unique. So later on, archaeologists came and started to look at it. They found hundreds, uh, 30,000 tablets, cuneiform tablets. These people in olden times knew how to keep uh, track of what was happening in the world. 
One very important note is history. We always say history starts with people learning how to read and write. The history in Asia Minor started with the Assyrian trade colonies of 17, 1800 BC. Hittites, there were a lot of Hittite names in those, so we know that there was somebody that took over from the indigenous group of Hattis and became the Hittite Empire. Hittite Empire became a very strong empire. They were very good in metallurgy, iron. They did iron weapons. They could conquer everything. They perfected the chariots. And the first written treaty, a world history, was in Kadesh in 1253 BC between the Egyptian pharaoh, Ramses II, and the Hittite king. So they are very important. They are an Indo-European uh, group of people. Their language, the cuneiform, was deciphered by finding some words like vatar, water, as essen, eating. So thus, that's how they were discovered. Well, mm -hmm. as the Hittite Empire collapsed around 1200 mm -hmm. BC, another kingdom emerged. The, I call it the Phrygian. Yeah, uh, Phrygian or Phrygian. Right. There were several that emerged. Phrygians actually took over some of the Hittite lands. Right. But their capital was Gordian. And we have a picture of the Gordian ruins right now, so we'll put that on the screen and yes. you can see that. And yes. so we, this is where the term Gordian knot comes Gordian into knot. play. Gord and also they had a king named King Midas. Midas. So you need to untangle that Gordian knot and use your Midas touch here to tell us what happened there. I love it. Gordian is uh, very close to Ankara. And there are all these tombs, tumuli, in Turkey, the amazing thing is, I mentioned that Turkey was like an open air museum. When you see these hills in Turkey, in America you would say, oh, they're just hills. In Turkey, there's something underneath, buried underneath. And this Gordium area has all these tombs, biggest one for the king. But what happened was, according to mythology, there was this uh, oracle who said, the first man who comes into the city on an oxen cart is going to be the king. So King Gordius comes in with his little oxen cart, comes to the city, and they make him the king. And his son Midas, of the Golden Touch, says, this is so important, we're going to make a big knot, and whoever can cut that or can untangle that knot is going to rule the world. So there comes Alexander the Great. He's too busy. He has very little life. <laughs> he has to conquer the world. So he doesn't want to worry about it. He just takes his sword and cuts it. <laughs> And the rest is history for Alexander the Great. But for Midas, Midas' story doesn't end. He was good to one of the gods, Dionysus. He helped his friends. So Dionysus said, what do you want? I'll give you whatever you want. He said, whatever I touch has to turn to gold. He said, you have it. So he touches this, it turns to gold. He touches that, turns to gold. But then he wants to eat and drink, and he can't because everything is turning to. So he goes back to Apollo. He says, take that from me. I don't want to anymore. So he says, okay, I can do that. You just have to go to the river Pactolus, wash yourself, and you'll be okay. He does that. River Pactolus has a lot of gold, which the Lydians took over, I'll tell you later. But he also has donkey's ears, because he butts his nose to every affair, according to the mythology. <laughs> there was a comp musical competition between Apollo and Pan, and the judge said Apollo is the winner. This Midas goes and says, no, 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 I think Pan was better than Apollo. So Apollo says, this guy doesn't even hear well. I'm going to give him a donkey's ear. So he, all his portrayals are with donkey's ear. So this is the story of Gordian. And we just have about 30 seconds before we go to the break, but uh, I understand that the uh, Phrygians were also involved with the Greeks and the uh, people of Troy and the Peloponnesian War? Well, of course, a, a lot of, interesting enough, in the Tro Trojan Wars, which are, uh, you know, uh, very important in history. Many of the Anatolian indigenous people sided with the Trojans. And that, has, uh, that is recorded, you know, Hector and Achilles running around the Trojan Wars and so forth. The Phrygians were involved in a lot of things, but they were not as huge an empire as the Hittite Empire because they also had competition with the Lydians and the late Hittite kingdoms in the southeastern part of Turkey. But yes, they are connected all together. They also spoke Indo-European. Most probably came from Thrace. A lot of things might change. Whatever I'm telling now <laughs> might change in a couple of years after new findings come out. So this is, the, this is the beauty of it. It changes every day. Well, what doesn't change for us is that we always have to go to the break right now. And so we'll of do course. that. Stay with us. When we come back from the break, we'll talk about the Lydian kingdom. Stay tuned.
Is law school in your future? A degree in history would be the perfect major for a student going in that direction. Perhaps you like historic preservation, or maybe government work in a federal, state, or local level. They are the largest employers in the nation, and they are looking for people with that kind of degree. The opportunities are endless with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Hello and welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly and my guest today is Angan Kadister. We're talking about the ancient civilizations of Turkey. Angan, when we left, we were talking about uh, the Phrygian kingdom. No kingdom lasts forever. That one certainly was sacked uh, right around 700 uh, AD, or excuse me, BC. BC. And at that time, another kingdom took over, which was the Lydian kingdom. Mm -hmm. They have a city known as Sardis, which mm -hmm. is uh, certainly an interesting uh, city to look at. We have a slide that we can put on the screen right now that shows us uh, an example of obvious Greco-Roman influence there with architecture. I believe that's a gymnasium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So at this time, about uh, 2,700 years ago to 2,500 years ago, the Jewish and Christian faiths are starting to form. Certainly the mm -hmm. Jewish faith mm -hmm. first, of course, of course. And, then and then Christianity the later. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. tell us about this Lydian kingdom. What is yeah. important about it? Sardis was the capital of the Lydian kingdom. Lydian kingdom really is almost contemporary with the Phrygian or Phrygian kingdom. Uh, they're, uh, they're very famous because they're the first people who minted coin for the first time. Until that time, people were just bartering things. With the coin, they now had money. And one of the reasons is it became a very rich kingdom. Uh, we have it in English, uh, English language. When you describe somebody who's very rich, you say he's as rich as King Croesus. And one of the reasons they became rich, remember um, uh, Midas who washed himself off of gold in the Pactolus River because he mm -hmm. had to get rid of gold? Well, that Pactolus River is full of gold, and the Lydians are right there. They used a lot of that gold and became very wealthy. Mm -hmm. uh, it became, uh, in, the, in the Jewish history, the Jews have lived in Asia Minor, Anatolia, or Turkey now, for, of course, hundreds of years from the very beginning. But most of the Jews in Turkey at this time, I might add, came from uh, Spain and Portugal during the Inquisition when we had the Ottoman Empire, they mm -hmm. invited the uh, Jews, they actually, they saved them in big boats, and all the Jews came to Turkey in 1492. So we still have a lot of Jews in Turkey who still speak Ladino after that. Mm -hmm. But the Jews of Sardis, of course, were not those. They were the original um, uh, Jews that came from um, the Middle East. And the synagogue there is among the most beautiful and restored synagogues. So we do, uh, we do like it a lot. And the shops next to the synagogue with all the names of the butchers and so forth, the, the uh, green grocers that worshiped in the synagogue are there. So it, may, it makes it very lively as if the city is living. As far as Christianity is concerned, Sardis is one of the seven churches of the Revelation. So it is an important place and people who visit Turkey to visit the seven churches of Asia, which are all in Turkey, Sardis is one of the most important ones. So it's, it's, worth, a, it's worth a visit. As we get closer to the time of Christ in Turkey, we then come to another area in southeastern Turkey known as Mount Nimrut. And we have an image that we want to put on the screen right now of that. Uh -huh. And so with that image, you can see that very large Huge. head. Uh -huh. uh, we have a king there named King Antiochus I. Uh -huh. uh, this is an area known as Comagene. Uh -huh. uh, he constructed, uh, King Antiochus constructed a number of those big structures. Those are just the heads, but we have full bodies, yes, I guess. Yes, we have full bodies. We have people sitting on the... Uh, thrones. I went there on a winter day when it was covered with snow. Seeing these huge statues in snow is something else. Here is the story about Comagen Kingdom. Uh, they were part of the Seleucids who, after Alexander the Great, his huge empire was divided among his generals. One of them was this guy. And as they were falling apart, this Comagen Kingdom appeared. And Antiochus I was a very wise man. He worshiped both Persian gods and the Greek gods. So nobody fought with him. He was at peace. He said hello to everybody. 
And he also thought that he and his family were also gods. So he had on this, this is a huge mountain. On top of the mountain is a huge tomb. We think the tomb is underneath, but nobody should go into it because everything might collapse. And right in front of that are these colossal statues overlooking at the plain. It is such an amazing site. It's one of the uh, 18 UNESCO World Heritage Sites of Turkey. Worth a visit, either sunset or sundown. That's where people try to visit that site. Well, we're gonna move on now to an area known as Cappadocia. Mm -hmm. And this is in North Central and Northeastern Turkey. It was prominent during the early Christian era. Um, interesting rock formations there. Some of them called fairy chimneys. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of canyons, mm -hmm. uh, rugged terrain. Uh, just generally, uh, you know, difficult, rugged terrain with lots of interesting rock formations. So, caves. What should we consider to be the most significant about this area? Cappadocia actually goes back to Hittite periods. The river, there's a river there which has such wonderful clay. That's where they made all the clay pots and everything. Cappadocia today is one of the most popular places to visit in Turkey. And one of the reasons is because the early people, starting from way before Christianity, built these underground cities going 12 stories under the earth. Some of them are connected to one another. And they could live there for months without ever getting out when they were running from one persecution uh, to another one, because this always happened. People ran away from one another. And you can go down to the underground cities and see their staples, their churches, their kitchens, their bedrooms. Everything is like a city, but they're 12 stories under the earth. Uh, then the people lived in those caves. The reason this happened is because of a natural f uh, uh, reason. There was a huge uh, volcano which brought a lot of tufa, love soft thing, and these amazing material created these surreal uh, pictures, including these fairy chimneys. We call them fairy chimneys because they look as if they were built there by fairies, not human beings. And today we have hotels that are carved into the caves. So if you complain about your hotel room not being too, too, too big, you can get a chisel and go inside and make it a little larger. This is what Cappadocia is. Just to inject a little humor here, they kind of remind me of the Flintstones. Yes, exactly. The cartoon The Flintstones, exactly. where people are living in the rocks. And exactly. And some entrepreneurial tourist people have uh, a sign which says, welcome to Flintstones, and you have your picture taken in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So now we're definitely into the Christian era mm -hmm. in Turkey. We're gonna go to the next area. There's a slide here of Ephesus, mm -hmm. and uh, this of course is referenced in the New Testament in mm -hmm. the book of Ephesians. So in Ephesus, you had an opportunity to bring a special couple uh, to tour that region. Who was that special couple? When I was a student of archaeology, I had the great privilege of guiding Queen Elizabeth, Prince Philip, and Princess Anne as they toured Ephesus. And you know, the Queen has been to everywhere in the world in the most wonderful bay way, but even she was flabbergasted as we walked on the marble streets. Ephesus is one of the, probably the best preserved ancient Roman city, the way you have it. You walk on marble streets, on left and right are buildings mosques, uh, uh, baths, and houses, and temples, even a house of ill repute, and ancient toilets, you name it, it's there. And importance, of course, very important in Christian history, not only because of the Ephesians, but also as a, one of the uh, seven churches of Asia, which Paul visited twice. As a matter of fact, if you look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19, there is a scene that is described that when uh, Paul was preaching Christianity, Ephesians did not want to accept Christianity because of Artemis, the mother goddess. So they shouted for hours, great is Diana or Artemis of Ephesians. So this story is mentioned in the Acts of the Pop Apostles and you can go today to sit in the seats of those people and visualize that event. Also for Roman Catholics, it's a place of pilgrimage. Roman Catholics believe that Mary spent her last years in Ephesus. It's a city one has to see. It should be in the bucket list of everybody. Amazing ancient city. All right, well, let's talk about uh, after the fall of Rome or uh, mm -hmm. as the church, the Christian mm -hmm. church evolved, it went to um, Constantinople mm -hmm. uh, in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And it became the Eastern, what's known as the Eastern Orthodox Church. Yeah. 
and then we have the Byzantium or Byzantine period mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at that time. We have another slide we want to put on right now, which shows the Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia. What happened was the great Roman Empire was divided into two as East and West. Mm -hmm. East Roman Empire came to Istanbul. At that time, it was called Byzantine. And it became eventually the Byzantine Empire. And the city of Byzantine was changed into Constantinople because of the Emperor Constantine, who was the first Christian. He, he converted to Christianity in the third, fourth century. And so it became Constantinople, and Byzantine Empire became the center of the Eastern, as you said, Orthodox Church. And it spread quite a bit, all Asia Minor today. And um, so it was a very powerful um, uh, empire. The Saint Sophia was built in the sixth century. It, is, it was the biggest temple ever built. It is still one of the most amazing buildings in the world. It was protected a little bit by the buttresses. When you see it today, you see these uh, uh, buttresses on the sides by uh, architect Sinan during the Ottoman Empire. So it's still standing there. 1500s later, huge temple still standing there. When the Turks conquered Istanbul in 1452, Fatih Mehmet, Sultan Mehmet II, uh, made it into a mosque. They covered the the plaster with plaster the mosaics and the frescoes and so forth it mm -hmm. became a mosque until 1931 i believe hang on let's let's show an image here of mm -hmm. what it looks like inside with the tiles the, yeah this is this uh, this is the blue mosque mm -hmm. which came after that okay when the turks came to uh, to uh, um, ottoman um, uh, when the turks conquered byzantine and established the ottoman empire mm -hmm. the saint sophia became a church and now it's a museum okay. it should belong it should always be a museum because it belongs to all of us it doesn't belong to muslims it doesn't belong to christian it belongs to the human population okay this mosque that you showed is part of the ottoman empire when the turks conquered istanbul they became a very large empire they went all the way up to vienna you should thank the Turks for your croissant that you eat at, in the morning, and the coffee, and the strudel. They all came from part of the Turkish invasions of Europe. And also, all Northern Africa was part of the Ottoman Empire, as well as all Middle East today. And of course, like every huge empire that comes and goes, the, the Ottoman Empire went away too. And now that we're running out of time, we've yes. only got about 30 seconds, uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, dissolved Ended. after World War one. one and so we have another slide to show the leader of modern turkey turkey turkish republic was founded by this great man named atatürk which means the father of all turks not only he was a great commander he uh, defeated everybody and formed the turkish republic which is a secular republic gave equal rights to women long before everybody else did in europe he is one of the great heroes as a matter of fact the greek um, he, the, the greek general that he fought against venizelos um, uh, wrote to the Nobel Committee that he should get the Nobel Peace Prize. This is one of the greatest human beings, I think, that could save a country like that. Mm -hmm. And on that note, I think we will have to conclude the program, but I mm -hmm. want to thank you for being here today and taking my us pleasure. on this fantastic tour. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure to talk about Turkey. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Talking Points. Be sure to join us again soon for the next episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.